to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the scripture says god wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 4. We welcome you today to our personal evangelism lessons on the subject of salvation. Friend, as we begin these lessons, we hope that each person will understand that our aim and motive in discussing these things is ultimately for all people everywhere to go to heaven. And so we encourage you to get your Bible and stay tuned as we're going to think about God's plan of salvation in this series of lessons. In studying on the subject of salvation and what must I do to be saved, a person must begin by understanding God's authority in religion and the all-sufficiency of the Bible. But before we actually get into the content of our personal evangelism series, we want you to know two very important things. First and foremost, as we study the Word of God together on this wonderful subject, please know that our motive in discussing these things with you is out of love. More than anything in all the world, we want you to go to heaven. We want you to be saved. We want one day to be in heaven with you for all eternity. And then, friend, we also want you to know this. More than anything, God wants you to be saved. He wants all men everywhere to be saved. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, And He wants it so bad that He sent His only begotten Son into the world that He would taste death for every man. 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2, and John chapter 3, verse 16. But as we think today about laying a foundation for becoming a Christian and obeying the gospel, the very first thing we've got to understand is, what is our authority in religion and is the Bible everything we need to build our faith upon? And friend, as we think about this idea, let's understand the Word of God. The Bible that we have is our authority in all matters of religion. We hope you got your Bible handy. We'll be putting some of the verses on the screen for you to look at as well. But friend, as we think about this subject of authority in religion, we begin by asking the question, what is it? What is it that the Bible says will make us free from sin? And we direct our attention to the words of Jesus in John chapter 8, verse 32. Notice what Jesus said. Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. What makes man free from sin? The truth. If we know God's truth, we can be free. And so truth is absolutely essential to being free from sin and really knowing that we're right with God. But you know, as you think about that idea of the truth setting you free, we also understand from the Scripture that truth is essential in worshiping God. How do we worship God correctly? By worshiping in truth. Notice John chapter 4, verse number 24. Jesus said, God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. How do I worship God in such a way that it's acceptable and pleasing to Him? I've got to worship in spirit and in truth. And so notice these two attributes of truth. The truth makes man free from sin. The truth is how I worship God in an acceptable way. Naturally then, we ask the most significant question related to this. What is truth? And friend, the Bible directs us to the subject of truth in Jesus' prayer in John 17, verse 17. Notice what Jesus said about the truth. Jesus, in praying to the Father, said these words, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. What is truth? You know, that's a question Pilate asked in John 18, 
verse number 36. And it's a question that a lot of people are asking today. And we've already seen the significance of it. It's the truth that makes me free, free from sin. It's the truth by which I worship God acceptably. What is truth? Listen to Jesus again. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Friend, we want to clearly understand that the word of God is absolute truth on all matters related to God and salvation and authority and putting God first in our life. And so it's so pivotal that we understand the Word of God is the basis for worshiping God correctly and for being saved. And friend, as we talk about this matter of authority and truth, we want to also realize that the words that our Lord spoke, the teaching of Jesus was from God. And it also is truth. Listen to the words of John chapter 14. I want you to notice verses 23 and 24. Jesus is speaking about His uh, truth, about what He's saying. And He says these words in John 14 verse 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. Now notice this. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. Remembering that God's word is truth, Jesus just clearly said, and oh yeah, what I tell you as well, that is truth. And so we hear the word of God, it's truth. What Jesus said, it's also true, and it's from God, and it's necessary for salvation. In fact, did you know that the way God speaks to us today is through the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? We might ask the question, how does God speak to men and women today? Listen to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, God, who at various times in various ways in the past, spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son. How does the Bible say God is speaking to us today? Through His Son, through the words of Jesus, which Jesus Himself said are the words of Almighty God. And so as we think about the matter of authority and the Word of God being truth, Jesus' Word being truth, that's how Jesus' words are how God is speaking to me and to you today. And friend, we also want to realize those words are authoritative. Those words are words that every person must listen to. In John chapter 3 and verse 35, the scripture clearly says that Jesus is the one who has authority over all men. Listen to these words. John 3 verse 35, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. How many things has the Father given into the hands of Jesus? All things. Everything is under the authority and the power of Jesus Christ. And so as we think about laying the foundation for personal Bible study, personal evangelism, we've got to understand Jesus has all authority and I must submit to Him. In fact, I want to direct your attention to these words. In Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said this to His disciples. He said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And then He said, Go and make disciples of all nations. Now, friend, let's stop and think about this for just a moment. How much authority does Jesus have? Well, Matthew 28, 18 says Jesus has all authority. If Jesus has all authority, how much does that leave for me and you or some man to create today? Well, none. Jesus has all authority in matters of religion, and we must, absolutely must, submit to His will. And friend, we also want to emphasize that Jesus has authority over all flesh, meaning all people living everywhere are under the authority of Jesus. Notice John chapter 17, and I want you to listen to what the Scripture says in verse number 2. John 17 verse 2, Jesus prayed to the Father and He said, As you have given Him authority over all flesh, that He should give eternal life to as many as you have given to Him. What about people halfway across the world? What about me and you today? What about other people in other places? 
Jesus has authority over all flesh and all people everywhere and we must to be saved we absolutely must understand he's the one in charge in fact we realize today that it is Jesus who is the head over the church who's in charge of the church you know sometimes I hear people say well in the Catholic Church it is the Pope in Rome who's the head of the church wait a minute now the church of the Lord is not decapitated it still has a head and Jesus is that head. Let's notice that from Scripture. I want to direct your attention to Ephesians chapter 1 and I want you to notice what the Bible says in verses 22 and 23. Who's the head of the church? Look at Ephesians 1 verse 22. The Bible says, And He, that is God, put all things under His feet and gave Him to be head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him, who fills all in all. God has made Jesus to be head over all things to the church. If Jesus is head over all things to the church, how much does that leave for me and you today? Jesus is in complete control of His church. Now, friend, as we think about this, does this mean that Jesus has all authority over the church? If He's head over all things and He's head of the church, how much authority does Jesus have over the church? All authority. Matthew 28, verse 18, He's got all authority in heaven and on earth, and that includes the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And friend, as you think about this, we, as we think about this idea, we want to understand that in talking about the Bible as our authority, we want to understand that on the day of judgment, on the last day, on that final day when I stand before God, what is it that's going to be my judge? Listen to Jesus' words in John 12, verse 48. Jesus said, He who rejects me and does not receive my word has that which judges him. Listen, the word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. When I stand before the throne of God, when my life has been completed, when I give an account for the things I've done in this life, books are open. What is going to be the standard of judgment? Is it going to be man's opinion? Is it going to be some catechism or some book written by men? No. Jesus said, my words are going to judge him. Friend, if it's the word of Christ that's going to judge us, what's our authority today and what must we listen to? The words of Jesus. Listen to John 6 verse 68. Jesus had made some hard statements. The Bible says some of the disciples walked with Him no more. He looked at the rest and said, Do you want to go away also? And here's what Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Who has the words of eternal life? Who is it that can tell you what you need to do, that can tell us what we need to do to go to heaven? Jesus. Friend, if that's the case, if Jesus has the words of eternal life, should we go to anyone else to learn about how to go to heaven? Should I go to uh, parents? Should I go to a preacher? Should I go to relatives or friends for them to tell me what they think I need to do to go to heaven? No. If Jesus has the words of eternal life, then I need to go to Jesus and let His Word teach me what I need to do to be saved. And so, as we lay this foundation for obeying the gospel, please understand the Bible God's Word and Jesus have all authority and He's the only one that I need to listen to to know what I need to do to go to heaven. But how did we get that Word from God which is authoritative today? Well, friend, we read the Bible and we realize that it is the Holy Spirit of God who guided the first century apostles into all truth which we now have today. I want you to notice with me John chapter 14. And I want us to look in verse number 26 as we think about God's Word being given to us through the Holy Spirit by the apostles. Listen to John 14, verse number 26. Jesus said, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. 
in that verse, did Jesus say the Holy Spirit would teach the first century apostles all things and bring everything Jesus said to their remembrance? Well, yes, He absolutely did. Thus, when the apostles, when the apostles taught by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, were they teaching their own words or the words of Jesus? Friend, Jesus just said He's going to teach you all things and remind you of what I said. And so when John, when Paul, when uh, Peter wrote under inspiration, it wasn't their words. It was the words of God, the words of the Holy Spirit. In fact, look at what the Bible says with me in John 16, verse number 13. Listen to these words. John 16, verse 13. Jesus made another promise to His apostles and it was this. However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will tell you things to come. Jesus said in this verse that the Holy Spirit would guide the apostles into how much truth. When He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He'll guide you into all truth. The promise was made in the first century that those apostles who took up pen under inspiration of the Holy Spirit would receive all truth. Now, did that happen in the lifetime of the apostles? Notice with me Jude verse 3. Jude writes and he says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, watch this now, which was once for all delivered to the saints. Is it the case that Jude said in the first century, in the life of the apostles, they would receive all truth? Was that faith delivered in their lifetime? Jude said it was once for all delivered. By the close of the New Testament, God had fulfilled the promise they would receive all truth. Now friend, here's the practical application of that. Since the apostles were guided into all religious truth in their lifetime, should we be expecting some new revelation? Should we be expecting to receive some new revelation today? Well, friend, we're basically asking, did the promise, did God make the promise they would receive all truth, and was that completed? And the Bible says it was. Therefore, can you have more than all? If God fulfilled that promise, and He did according to Jude verse 3, you can't have more than all truth today in the Word of God. And so what we want to see is God fulfilled His promise through the Holy Spirit by the apostles. And we want to notice that that written Word, what they wrote down under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that's our guide in religion today. In John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, the Bible says this, Truly, many other signs Jesus did in the presence of His disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing you might have life in His name. Friend, that verse teaches us that the things that are written are written so that we might believe Jesus is the Son of God and that we might have eternal life in His name. Why did God write the Bible? So that I can believe in Christ and go to heaven. Did God give us a book that's able to do that? Absolutely He did. 1 John 5 verse 13, John writes, These things we've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. Why did John write those things? Listen now. These things are written. Why? That you may know you have eternal life. The Bible, the inspired Word of God is written so that I can know Jesus so that I can go to heaven and so that I can be confident I have eternal life. Now, you think about this. If somebody tells you this is what God says you need to do, how do you know that person telling you the truth? If somebody says, this is what we think our tradition or our catechism says you need to be do, do to be right with God. How do, you, how do you know? If you read it in the Bible and it's the Word of God, can you be sure? You can't be sure about these other books. I've read other books of men and, you know, those books may have some truth to them, but how can you know what they're telling is true? You can know. The Bible is the Word of God, and the inspired Word of God ought to be our only guide in religion. Listen to Romans 10, verse 17. The Scripture says, Faith comes by hearing, 
and hearing by the Word of God. Now each of us realizes faith is essential to salvation. But here's the big question. How do you get faith? Do you get faith by my words? Do you get faith by reading the books of men? No. Faith comes by hearing and hearing what? By the Word of God. The only way to get real faith faith you can build your, uh, build your Christianity and your salvation around is by the Word of God. It's our only guide in matters of religion. James 1.21 says it this way, We're to receive with meekness the implanted Word which is able to save our soul. What's able to save my soul and your soul? The Word of God. Do you remember 1 Peter 1 verse 23? Seeing that we've been born again not by things perishable or incorruptible, but by the Word of God. We're born again by the Word of God which lives and abides forever. You know, we hear a lot about being born again. How does the Bible say you're born again? We're born again by the Word of God. 1 Peter 1 verse 23. Friend, if that's the case, should I go to any other source to learn how to be saved? If the Word of God is able to help me to be born again, if it creates faith, do I need any other source than the Bible to know God and to go to heaven? Not according to the Scripture. Listen to these words. In 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, the Scripture says, All Scripture, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Friend, in that passage, does the Bible claim that it is able to thoroughly equip us for every good work? Well, it absolutely does. Listen now, if the Bible promises it can thoroughly equip us, all Scripture can thoroughly equip us for every good work, do we need additional revelations to be complete before God? Well, no, if the Bible makes that claim, and it, it is truth, we've already seen that, I don't need additional revelations to be complete before God. Um, do, do I need the Book of Mormon, which was written, uh, claimed to be written by God 1800 years later? We know that that doesn't hold up to truth, but do I need the Book of Mormon if the Bible claims it's everything we need to get to heaven? No. Do I need church traditions? Do we need manuals? Do we need creed books or confessions of faith to make us complete spiritually? Friend, that verse clearly said all we need to be thoroughly or completely equipped before God is His Word. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 puts it in a beautiful way. According to His divine power, God has given to us all things for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. Now friend, let's ask a question based on that verse. Does that verse say God has given to us all things pertaining to life and godliness. Well, you notice the verse, and it does. God's given to us all things. Now, let's make application to that. Since God has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness in the Bible, do I need to go to any other source as my religious authority today? Now, friend, Think real carefully about this. It's the truth that saves us. We worship God according to the truth. The Bible is all truth. 2 Peter 1 verse 3. It has everything we need to equip us and make us right before God. If that's the case, then I don't need any other books. What we're trying to really impress from the Scripture today is this book, the Bible, and the Bible only is all we need to be right before God. And friend, if that's the case, whatever this book says, regardless of what other books may say, regardless of what other men may say, regardless of what family members or some preacher somewhere may say, whatever this book says, and all it says is what I've got to do to be saved. If I can come to the realization, if the individual can come to the realization, Jesus' words are going to judge me. This book has all truth. This book is everything I need for life and godliness. And this book, in and of itself, will completely equip me for every good work. And friend, my faith can be built on the Word of God. And listen, I can know that I'm saved because the Bible tells me I'm saved. If this book 
is the Word of God breathed out of the mouth of God, and I do what it says, then from the mouth of God I can know that I'm right and that I'm true in His sight. Friend, we ask you today to consider your own salvation. We ask you to consider uh, your, your religious belief and religious background. Is your faith really built on the Word of God, or is it built on the traditions of men? We hope that you'll stay tuned in this series of lessons because we're going to discuss what the Bible says one has to do to be saved and be a member of the one church. But if you've never obeyed the gospel, friend, we hope that you'll continue to study with us, write to us or call us. We'd love to study the Word of God with you as we think about matters concerning salvation. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.